Hello, uh, my name is Tony Minicello and welcome to Athletics Weekly, Ask the Athlete, or in this case, Ask the Coach. So, my, um, as I said, my name is Tony Minicello. I've been coaching, whew, it's, about 30, it's about 35, 36 years now, not all in athletics. Started my career coaching a little bit in basketball and athletics during the summer and then drifted more into athletics. So, Yes, notably coach to Dame Jessica Ennis-Hill, the 2012 um, Olympic champion, gold medalist and three-time outdoor world champion. Um, yeah, I, and, and mainly I've been coaching in combined events. So welcome. I hope you enjoy this. So looking through these questions, what inspired you to coach heptathletes and decathletes? That's a really interesting start. Um, my background, when I first got involved in coaching, what I wanted to do was coach throwers. And that's where I started. I really coached throws. Discus, javelin, shot put were particularly the ones. Not much of a hammer coach, I must say. Um, but my philosophy was that the athletes who came into throws wouldn't just throw. So they had to be able to hurdle, long jump, high jump, do lots and lots of different things. Because I was really very keen that they had an all-round athletic development. Um, and then with one or two of the athletes, when they were doing multi-event competitions, they enjoyed it. The plan was that by the time they came to their last year juniors, sort of 18, 19, finishing A-levels, they'd then start to specialise in, in the throw. Um, as it turned out, a lot of the athletes said they didn't want to specialise. They didn't want to just be a, a shot putter or a discus thrower. And they wanted to stick with um, doing combined events. So, yeah, I think my athletes... What inspired me, I did as I was told. Um, athletes wanted to do heptathlon and decathlon, so I ended up coaching in that area and, and, it, and developing my skills in lots of different events to that extent. What would a typical week look like for you as a coach? Um, that's an interesting question because there's no such thing as a typical week anymore, unfortunately, due to this COVID pandemic. But... Normally, um, in a non-pandemic year, we would we'd be training once or twice a day, uh, Monday through Friday, and again, twice on a Sunday. Saturday tends to be the rest day with my group. Um, we tend to do a track-based session and then maybe some conditioning work in the, in the afternoon. Um, they lift weights three times a week, so they'll go into a gym. Uh, we do circuit training, which is bodyweight exercises on another day. Um, and then a fair amount of probably one to two events um, in each day, maybe three at the most. So kind of like a run, jump, throw within a training session. Um, we try to do it in the in line with the combined event um, order. So you do something like a, a, a shot put session, a high jump session, followed by a running session. So we break it down that way. Um, that's, that's typically what happens on a day to day basis. Do you think Katarina Johnson Thompson or Nafi Tiam could break the heptathlon world record? Now then, now you're talking 7,200. Um, I think it's a tough ask. I think it's a very tough ask. It's an outstanding, outstanding world record and will be tough to beat. Because if you look, look at it, Jackie Joyner Kersey ran something like 22 point in the 200 as well as jumping phenomenally far in the long jump and hijack all of that there isn't a weak event really in in the whole of the seven so i think they could get close i certainly think nafi tiam has already broken seven thousand points and katarina johnson thompson looks on the verge of breaking seven thousand points and got so so close in doha so yes they can go seven thousand points but to get as high as seven three i'm not sure i don't see it so sorry if that upsets anybody, but I, I, I think it's such a tough ask. Um, it's such an outstanding world record. How much of the coaching process towards an elite level athlete is psychological? And would you say that it varies between the individual and the multi-event discipline? Wow, that's a deep question. Um, is it psychological? If you if you break up coaching as being you coach the physical, their physical abilities, strength, speed, technique, 
as being one side of it, and then your mental approach to it as being a separate side of it, then you would have to say there has to be a huge amount of psychological comes into the event. And around that, I think that's based on confidence most of the time. Is an athlete confident? Are they assured of what the technique is and how to correct it should they get into difficulties or, or being able to correct or needing to correct? Can they, can they analyse that or do they need support? So, yeah, there's a large proportion of it is, is psychological and that's about confidence, knowing what you're capable of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and not being distracted by the opposition. So, for example, if you go into the shot put circle, are you comfortable and confident that you can throw a particular distance? And that comes from lots and lots of practice and consistent movement patterns. Um, but also from a psychological point of view, if somebody throws outstandingly further, that it doesn't, you know, that you don't feel, oh, I need to throw that far to keep up because it's about you, the individual. So certainly the way I approach things is that you have a particular shape to your heptathlon. So if you take a Jessica Ennis, very good at hurdles, very good at high jump, a shot put wasn't that bad, really. A 14 meter shot put, her, put her in the top five, top six. So you know that you're going to lose points to people or, or the margin is going to decrease of your lead. But you're going to get that back in the 200, lose it maybe a little bit in the long jump, lose it a little bit in the javelin, but then have enough going into the 800, knowing that you can regain any margin at that point. So, yeah, it's, it's about confidence. It's about understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are and how when they all come together, that that produces your score overall. Um, next question here. What inspirational, motivational words and phrases does Tony use to connect with his athletes? Um, I don't think I've ever inspirational and motivational. That's really interesting. It's very difficult for me to pick out a particular phrase or anything. Like it, it, certainly giving praise when something's done well, you know, giving praise for why it's done well, um, and also giving them an attachment to that praise. So that was good because. That's excellent because that's so much better because, you know, th those kind of things. So there's an attachment. So they know that that particular function within a technique is what's good. So you're attaching the two. So from that, well done, encouraging people. Um, certainly getting athletes to believe in themselves is an important thing that, that people need to back themselves. You know, be confident in what you do. Be confident in your strengths. Um, from that point of view and know that your weaknesses can get better. Uh, and that's really what we're striving to do is, to, is just to get better. Now, this is an old chestnut question, really, this one. Why has Britain not produced a world-class decathlete for such a long time? Um, numerous, probably, reasons. Very difficult, really, to, to, to put in a nutshell. I think the difficulty is the, the event is is so big and so tough in that sense. The amount of hours you need to be able to train for it and the number of years you need to train to it to be able to come through at the elite level. So one of the difficulties is that, unfortunately, our funding system that would, would enable people to be full-time doesn't stretch far enough down to, either, to support people to become full-time professionals in that event. Um, I think that... So, you need to be able to spend four or five hours a day, I think, training for the for the decathlete. Now, if you're doing that, now that has an effect on you education-wise, it has an effect on you work-wise. So to be able to train for it full-time is difficult, I think, for people. Um, for them to be able to train full-time for long enough, the four or five years to develop themselves into that kind of athlete, again, is very, very difficult because sponsorship only comes through if you're, if you're part of that super elite early on. So that's a difficulty. Coaching wise, again, the skill sets that you need as a coach to be able to deliver is is difficult. Um, the facilities, throws, heavy throws, it's becoming more and more difficult um, to find facilities to be able to do it indoors, outdoors, pole vault um, and that kind of thing. So I think to bring that all together, I think probably one of the, the best decathlon coach in the country is probably, I would have to say, is Greg Richards. Um, brilliant, has done so much with Dean Macy and uh, Daniel Ord and, and a number of others. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he moved abroad for a while, but he's back now. So I, I see him as being 
somebody who's done it really, really well. But, uh, you know, it, there, there aren't that many Greg Richards, unfortunately, in our coaching fraternity. Uh, um, and it, it's tough. We, we need to develop more decathlon coaches in Britain. And we need to go out and, and encourage people to come into our event because I don't think it's as popular, possibly because we haven't got that Daley Thompson type figure now. Um, the, the numbers of people being able to take take part in the event. In addition, the number of decathlons that there are up and down the country, it is difficult to find competition as well. So they all sort of add together, I think, as to why it's been difficult for us to produce a world-class decathlete. What sort of strength exercises did Jessica Ernest do in the gym? Um, so Jess trained, um, if you're talking strength exercises, yes, she did body weight exercises, circuit training, press-ups, sit-ups, squat jumps, all of those kind of things within a particular session. And that's really where she started at a young age, was doing lots and lots of body weight work. And then she progressed into gym work around about the age of 16, 15, 16. We started doing little bits of work, uh, little bits with dumbbells and things like that, um, and, and little bits of machine-orientated work. So that's where she really started. Um, and then in the gym, she did a wide range of, of exercises, uh, shoulder press, squats, squ variations of squat, half squat, full squat, uh, cleans from the floor, hang cleans, hang snatch, just lots and lots of varied things, pull downs, leg extension, leg curl, bench press, incline bench press, and then lots of ancillary things that work sort of shoulder exercises lots of movement that would just enable the shoulder to develop uh and things like that so a very varied program um and that that consisted to out throughout the whole of her her career really it's a very general program wasn't overly specific um if there were weaknesses so she did have a few calf issues um so we we added in seated calf raises um calf raises and eccentric calf loading as well in order to help her in those kind of areas. So my, my advice is to have a very general program. If an athlete has a particular weakness, then to work in that area. Um, what event would Jess Ennis Hill have, have been best at outside of the heptathlon? Um, when she first started, a lot of people thought she would have been a high jumper. Um, and that was the, the area that people looked at and thought that, that that would be the thing that she'd be good at. I think by the end of her career, I think really if you look at her time in the hurdles at 12.54, which was, which was a British record at the time, I think you'd probably have to say that that would have been her best event, sprint hurdles. Um, some people have asked why she never did 400 hurdles. I just don't think she fancied the lactic acid of that event. But it, when you looked at her 800-metre time and you looked at her hurdling ability, you'd have said, Maybe, maybe the two would have fitted together, but hey, we'll never know. It's all conjecture. Uh, were there athletes you trained that questioned your coaching ability as you didn't yourself compete at, at a professional level? Uh, <laughs> um, I think athletes always question my coaching ability. They've always got to ask a question or two, and, and rightly so. I think any athlete should should question what you're doing as a coach and you should be as a coach able to answer that question. So um, they never questioned it because I didn't compete at the highest level. I think that's pretty much known from, from the off. So um, yeah, I, I, I haven't really had that, that problem to be honest, but I think as a coach, you've always got to be able to answer the questions that your athletes ask you and always discuss it uh, and try and work with them as partners within the process because that coach-athlete relationship is a critical piece. Uh, should women do decathlon at major championships? Is the desire there amongst the current and upcoming female multi-eventers? That's a really interesting question. Should women do decathlon at major championships? I had this discussion with Jess and said, and I've had it with my current crop of athletes, would you do decathlon? Would you want to? And their answer to me is no. They don't, they don't want to do decathlon. In fact, one of them did turn around and said, why don't the men do heptathlon? Which, again, is an interesting angle. Um, it, it's an interesting one. Decathlon is there. Um, I personally have a little bit of an issue with it um, because 
I think as a nation, we've been fantastically good. Remember, from the last six Olympics, we've won a medal in the heptathlon, six out of six of the last Olympics. And hopefully it's going to be seven from seven. So that's a massive trail. Would we as a nation really want to throw that away? Um, possibly not. No, it's not to say that we couldn't win a medal at decathlon. Um, I think, again, it comes down to time. Uh, I think it's very easy for women in Britain. We have a tremendous number of role models, and that brings girls, women into the event. And I think that's absolutely to be commended. Um, I have one issue with it. Is, it's that if you look at the international program, what they do with the women's decathlon is they take the middle three events from day one and put them on day two. So basically on day one, you'd run the 100 metres, you'd then throw discus, you'd then pole vault, you'd then throw javelin, and then run a 400. But then the following day, what you're doing is after the hurdles is you're running, uh, you're doing a long jump, then a shot put, then a high jump, and then run the 1500. So when you're at your most tired and under the most kind of pressure, you're then having to do those technical events that are really tough on the tendons, things like that. And I think that's probably, that's going to be tough on athletes and may lead to injuries. Um, the reason for doing that mechanism is because what they want to be able to do is have men's and women's decathlon on at exactly the same time so uh, in the, within the same competition so that the use of facilities pole vault beds and so on so that's why they want to do it but i think it, it, that's unfair on the women if you look at major championships now certainly the olympic program the heptathlon and the decathlon are on the same two days so again um that's been a move towards those kind of things, which again, I think will make it difficult for women to do decathlon. Um, so for a, for a few reasons, really, should women do decathlon? It's there as an option, as, as an event, it's there, it's open. Um, current, my current multi-events or multi-events I speak to in the women, they're not interested in doing decathlon. Um, a lot of people that are advocating it are either people who it doesn't affect, people who don't coach it or don't currently coach heptathlon, they're not advocating it. Um, they're all people who sit outside the event or have retired from the event think it's a really good idea, but it doesn't affect them. I think if you're looking at this as an area, you have to go and talk to the people it directly affects, and that's the athlete whose event has changed. There's also another counter argument that if you start looking at women's decathlon and equalizing of the events, isn't it time we looked at the weight of the discus, the weight of the shot put, things like that, uh, the height of hurdles? And I think if they were to change initially, then there's a bedding in period that's needed because I do think the women's hurdles are too low. Um, now, if you look at a lot of athletes having to break and, and slow down between the hurdles in order to make them, even at the, at the women's event as well, shot put, things like that. Would you look at those events first and make alteration there first before you'd look at decathlon? Possibly. Um should all kids starting athletics do multi-events? How could we recruit and train enough technical coaches to make it possible? I 100% agree with this. All kids, regardless, should do some form of multidisciplinary sports. Uh, you know, they should run, jump, throw. The, the, the information that's out there um, is that the more general an approach you have to your sporting background of having played a number of sports before specializing in one sport prior to the age of sort of 13, 13, 14 is seen as being what, what winners have done in their lives. So, you know, there's examples of Pete Sampras not picking up a tennis racket in, in until his early teens. So again, that multidiscipline approach I think should be, I, I think, but you need a competition structure that allows that to happen. So do we need to revisit some of the formats, maybe like English schools, that there's an English schools format that has two or three events involved um, that you compete in two or three events. Maybe that should be something instead of the individual event. Um, I think the German championships, I think it was, didn't allow people of a young age to enter the national championships unless they got a second event. And that had to be either a jump or a throw if they were doing a track event, or if they're doing a sprint, they had to do a middle distance, a jump or a throw. So again, that, that encouragement, we'd have to look very hard, I think, at the competition structures. Um, and again, leagues, maybe leagues should be set up that you take a number of smaller teams and they have um, 
a combined events element that there's a run jump throw that these athletes have to do and then their points are added together based on performance as opposed to based on finishing position so again doing that your supplementary question about coaching yeah i do i do think it's an interesting one that the head of coaching and development is an advert at the minute that's out there and mark monroe i think is a super guy who who's running that recruitment process uh looking for somebody that is a that's a big point maybe our coaching qualifications at the lower end should not be specialized they you do have to learn in in being able to teach youngsters of a of a certain age to run jump throw that would be i think a brilliant step forwards um i, I think it's all of that the balance with that is the fact that obviously youngsters come down to the track and either parents or the youngster have decided that they want to be an 800 meter run they want to be a javelin thrower and that's all they want to do um again it's you as a coach and the skill of of, of coaching really when you talk to people and say it's good that you want to do that event but you will need to hurdle you will need to throw other things you will need to run these kind of things because your all-around athletic development is important um and and it's good for health and fitness for me so yeah maybe those things will be looked at the coaching awards um and again i think it helps people i i, I see a lot of coaches at tracks working with large groups of of, of children and trying to keep them engaged for an hour, hour and a half type session is difficult unless you've got different things to go to. So again, yeah, avoid early specialization, multi activities for everybody. Now this question, I've always been intrigued as to what coaches go through with the, with a heptathlete when they go to the side of the track after each jump or throw, how effective is that feedback and should it be allowed at all? Now then, um, it depends is the simple answer yeah a lot of it when i when i had conversations uh with jess at side track coaching's coaching so why would you not allow coaching at the side of a track does it add a value you'd have to ask the athletes for that but i think it does there are words of support words of encouragement little slight adjustments that you can do in the field events um you know move your runway back about a shoe because you're crowding these things these are external things that a coach can spot it's very difficult for an athlete to to work that out for themselves um not everybody gets the benefit of of the video feedback on the large diamond screens in the in the stadium so sometimes you see it sometimes you don't flashes up flashes off you miss it you don't get to reflect upon your your practice I think it's there. It's what you're trying to do. Does it add benefit? Yes. It, it's, it's trying to benefit the athlete to produce a better performance um, at every time. Sometimes the conversations I've had, certainly with Jess, were more about encouragement. So she'd come to the sideline and say, you know, I thought that was really good. It was this. I did this, this, and then and you're like, yep, you did. That's perfect. Keep doing it. Let's go. Good. Come on. Build, you know, the, that kind of thing. Does it? Does it happen? So, yeah, it should definitely be allowed. I, I, I think it's ridiculous that you don't, that you can't have conversations and things like that. These people spend their lives working together with coaches. Why would you take that away from them at the moment of competition? Um, you know, what, what are we going to do? Mute a crowd and you can't shout encouragement. You can't applaud because that might be deemed as encouragement or something like that. We wouldn't do that. So I don't think you should take it away from 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 any athlete at that point and you can add, can add value because part of being able part of my role as a coach is to keep people in the sport and people who have limited experience in the sport and are new to the sport need that support need that encouragement so on and so forth so that that for me is is very very important um what do you think about the move away from a medal focus mentality with regards to squad selection for championships? Do you see this as a good move for athlete development? Um, twofold. I'm not sure there is actually a movement away from a medal focus mentality, unfortunately, in our sport. And I think that's borne out by um, the selection policies that have come out for European under 20s and, and European under 23s. They're still based on your ability to succeed and win medals. So qualifying standards are based on either a top five finish or a top eight finish. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think at the age group level, we should take the biggest teams that we possibly can and anybody who has qualified should be able to go. I don't think that would increase our, our, our age group teams 
possibly that much, having done a little bit of a study. You took in maybe an extra 10 athletes or so in a team. What's the additional cost of that? I, again, I don't think it's it's that big. But I think also what's clearly important and what's borne out by all the academic research is that your experience as an athlete at major championships, the more you have of it, helps you cope with the experiences at major championships. And if you can cope with the major championships, then you're more likely to win a medal and succeed. So I think it's massively, massively important, but I'm not seeing it in the literature yet, that we do take big teams, certainly to age group championships. And I think certainly to things like Commonwealth Games, I think things like European championships, we should take the biggest teams possible. Where we are funded, and again, this is the balance between UK sports funding philosophy. They're talking about medals and more is the expression they use, but they've not really described or defined what more is and not given direction, which is unfortunate. I think they need to be more directive in what that means. Um, and I, I've certainly had arguments with, with people from other sports that athletics takes too big a team to the Olympics and that and you should take less and, and these kind of things. And one of the sports suggested they took fewer athletes and won more, more medals. My response to that would be a simple one. Well, take no athletes and win 50 medals if you can. That's not what it's about. It's about experiences. It's about export. Um, it's about experiences in the sport. It's about athletes becoming role models. And you don't necessarily have to win a medal to be a role model. If you see somebody down at your track who's got a GB tracksuit on and they went to a major championships, You'd be, a, you'd be surprised at how inspirational that is to young kids to see somebody with Great Britain emblazoned on the back or to have seen that athlete on the TV recently uh, at that kind of championships, you know, because then it becomes real. Even if you look at Seb Coe's inspiration for, for his athletic career, he, he makes note of John and Sheila Sherwood who came back from the Olympics. Yes, they won medals, but they were local people who won medals. So again... It's, it's critically important, I think, for us as a sport to do that. We may have to pedal against or swim against the tide a little bit on that one, but athletics needs to stand up and say, no, we, it's not about medals, certainly not about medals at age group. It's not about medals at Commonwealth Games. It's about inspiring generation after generation. And again, the European Championships is another example. Let's take, we should fill the team. If, every, if everybody's qualified, we fill a team. The aim is to take 120 athletes or 124 athletes to the Olympic Games. That should be our target uh, of getting people across that line. So, yeah, um, I think it's a good, it's a great move. I just need to see the courage from the British UK Athletics Board in actually pushing that. And the, and the performance team under Christian Malcolm and Sarah Simonton, especially as the PD, to push that, push that, push back at UK Sport and go... We need money to do this. This is what we're trying to do. So good luck to them in that endeavour.